That's a warm welcome. Thanks. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, you do. Very good. Thank you. It's a big honor to be here. It all started with a PyTai meetup uh, one year ago, and now here we go. Very cool. Love it. And because I'm a guest here, I thought I need to adjust my picture to Thai style, Thai gangster style. But I was told that I look like Joy Boy. Uh, who knows who is Joy Boy? Anybody? Do I look like Joy Boy? Is it cool? I hope so. Maybe I put it on my badge after that. So who am I? I'm Anton. I live in Munich, Germany. I do organize events, including I organized PyCon Germany a while ago, though, like seven years ago. I have a little web conference, PyCon Web, in Munich as well, and I run the agency. The agency is called Tech5. We do consulting and cloud services. And I love going on the conferences. So conference is like a reason number one for me to visit new place, new country. So Thailand is not really new for me. I love this country, but like I've never been on this conference, so I feel really, really happy about it. Now let's go back to the topic because we have a lot of content today. The cloud, do you even need it? It's still, it's still under, under, under question, you know, if we really need the cloud to build our systems. Like, there are many stories recently, including 37 Signals or Basecamp, who left the cloud. 37 Signals say that they are saving something like 7 million on not using the cloud. They previously used AWS, I think. So, yeah, there are fairly good reasons to dislike the cloud. And maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe you are developing some computation intense software. Maybe you are mining bitcoins. Maybe you are training a new large language model. Maybe you are just a hardware hacker. Maybe you are some humanoid robot who needs really this huge powerful data center. You want to heat up your apartment in winter. I don't know, maybe, maybe that's you. But also maybe that's you. I don't know. So this is really up to you to decide if you have good reason to not use the cloud because this talk is about the cloud and although I know you can go around it, it's at the end your call. So cloud. Cloud is not just a virtual machine or a serverless function as many people still think. Like last time I checked, AWS has offered over 250 services, I think. It's everything. It's like managed databases, AI, machine learning services, container orchestration, IoT services, analytics, identity and access management, lots of things, and so on and so forth. So I would say, for me, the cloud is more like a mashup of services or something that makes me very easy to create a mashup of services. It's a rich landscape of technologies to enable the new way of building things and deploying things, and most importantly, managing things. So what is the right way to provision and manage things in the cloud? Well, there are many ways, and I will go quickly over these ways now. At the end, if I'm still in time, I will show you a demo of one way that really works well for me. So don't be confused. I will show you many things now, but at the end on the demo, I will really go in detail about that. So let's start from very beginning. Like the easiest is, of course, to just go to the website of the cloud provider, like AWS Web Console, something like this start clicking around. And this is also valid, because if you're new to the technology, probably you will not start with the code or uh, API uh, or command line tools. You will still, for most of us, probably this is the entry point to the cloud. We first go register, create an account, confirm email, set things up. So this is still valid. Uh, this is one way of exploring things in the cloud. And what's good about it, it's very quick. We just go on the website, we register, done, we can use it. We want a new virtual machine, click there, done, we can use it. We want a server function, done. It's also very intuitive. We probably do not need to read any tutorials when we are on the website. We just click, 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 and we are there. And there are tons of videos about everything. Every cloud is so well documented in both documentation of the cloud provider and videos, tutorials, where to click to get what. But it's repetitive, of course. You need to create multiple resources, you need to click again. It's error prone. Obviously, you, you, you can just click in the wrong place. It's time consuming, it's hard to audit, and it's not reproducible. So then, what can we do next? We can use APIs. 
uh, or command line tools, so like Boto for Python or AWS CLI. Now the question here is what happens if the API call fails? How do I roll back? How do I make updates? How do I know if the resource is ready or is it still provisioning? So this would be more or less how would you call Boto directly to just create the EC2 instance. It's short, it's also understandable, but I bet you will still need to Google to get this code. So yeah, to play around, why not? What's good about that? It's Python, it's some sort of automation. What's bad about it? As I say, you do not know the state of resource, it's kind of mysterious, and it's still time consuming to do this. So we go to the next level, cloud formation. Uh, what is cloud formation? And by cloud formation, I mean not just that particular technology, but all the zoo of the similar technologies out there. This is a language by AWS, how you can describe your cloud resources. Uh, but this is already a provisioning engine running behind it. So you write code, although it's not really executable code, it's not Python, but it's sort of code. It's a markup language, YAML or JSON. This is how it works. Uh, here on top is the current state in AWS. Then on the left, you have your cloud formation template. And what the engine of provisioning does, the AWS cloud formation, it's always checking if the state that you have in the cloud corresponds to the state that you have in your template. If it does not, there will be changes applied. If it does, then it just stays as it is. And this is uh, how your uh, template looks like. So this is JSON, but as I say, YAML is, uh, is also possible. Uh, what's good about it? It's declarative. So finally, you are very explicit about what you want. You can save this thing in Git, version it. You see who is the author. You can repeat it. It's reproducible. Uh, and you can define pretty much anything in AWS, at least uh, with cloud formation. What's bad? It's verbose. It's yet another syntax that you need to learn because yeah, it's just JSON or YAML, but to learn all of these keys and values, you need to read tons of manuals and there will be errors, like a lot of errors that you will do on the way. Plus, uh, it's just a markup language, so there, are no, there is no support uh, for loops or conditionals. Like you cannot say, if this condition is met, then create this resource, otherwise create this resource, at least not out of the box. So you might need some Jinja 2 on top to generate these things dynamically. And now finally, like it's huge. Cloud formation templates and all alike templates, they are so huge that, I don't know, you, you really need to like uh, Shakespeare or something that you read these big tons of cloud formation files just to understand the simple thing. So what's the next step? Terraform. Terraform is, let, let's admit it, it's a de facto standard in the industry. This is uh, like a standard tool to the infrastructure as a code landscape, particularly for multi-cloud setups. Uh, this is really a strength of Terraform, its ability to manage resources across the cloud. It's also using its own language, and it's also not a programming language, it's more towards, I, I, I know how to call it correctly, for me it's still sort of a markup language because I cannot execute things uh, like in Python. Uh, but it's not as huge as cloud formation, there is a huge community around it, so I will just go to the next slide so you can see all of the advantages and what I mean by that. So uh, it's open source, which means transparency. It's standard de facto, which means a huge community and ecosystem. It has its own domain-specific language, uh, HCL, I think it's called, and that brings a terrible learning curve. Like uh, it's declarative syntax, you just need to learn it, otherwise you don't understand anything. It's pretty confusing. Uh, it's not so easy to understand how it's managing the state. It's using its own internal thing to manage the state. It's not on the cloud provider, it's just on Terraform itself. How is it ensuring consistency of the state, which is yet another thing you need to understand. Uh, yeah, then again, uh, so Terraform needs so detailed configuration that it also kind of reminds me of Shakespeare because both are the classics and both are very verbose and with both, you need to read many times to understand anything there. Now, next tool, and this is already next step towards the beauty of cloud provisioning with Python, is Pulumi. Unlike other infrastructure as a code tools, 
Pulumi allows us to define, deploy, and manage cloud infrastructure using languages like Python. So it's not just Python. There are many languages that are supported there. So without relying on any uh, markup language, the main specific language, uh, it's, using, it's relying on the tools that you probably already know if you're on this conference. I think it's Python, TypeScript, JS, Go, something like this. Uh, then it's multi-cloud, just like Terraform. And just like Terraform, what's important, it's not using any intermediary uh, steps like cloud formation templates. When you create infrastructure with Pulumi or with Terraform, the tool is calling the API of cloud provider directly. Uh, I think it's an advantage. It's also more clean. So when you write something like, I want to have a resource, an EC2 instance, it will just call on the background AWS, AWS API and say exactly that, create EC2 instance. The, it will be not using any intermediary steps like AWS CDK does, which I will show you in the next section now. Um, yeah, uh, with uh, Pulumi, because it's at the end for us, it's just Python, you can create reusable components. This is super important. So a resource is a Python class. You can save it, you can copy it, you can share it on GitHub, you can inherit. So all the power of Python is available to you to develop cloud resources. And this is a couple of screenshots that I have how it looks like. Again, there will be a demo later, so you don't really need to understand all of it right now. But to prove my point, this is how you create a Lambda function. So you see on top aws.lambda.function, and then you pass a name, and then you pass a role, a runtime handler, and below that, the environment with environment variables. I think this is super explicit. You write it once, you remember it. If not, IDE will help you. Uh, you do not need to learn another language, as I said. So big, big, big plus for Pulumi for that. This is how you create a load balancer. This is how you create a listener on load balancer. So similar, you are just calling some, you are uh, instantiating some classes or you're calling some functions and you're passing arguments in. This is something that we developers are used so much to do that for us this is very intuitive, I think. One minus that I also have to show you. Pulumi is not on such a high abstraction level because it's multi-cloud. It has to support things from a line of providers for the cloud, so it cannot really abstract away everything. So some things you still have to pass the old-fashioned way. And this is the example of it. If you want to create a Lambda policy in AWS, the policy is just JSON. So this is basically a cloud formation piece included in Pulumi. So if you want to be very detailed, you still need to go to the specific of the particular cloud. Now, the last in my lineup is AWS CDK, Cloud Development Kit. So this is a framework from AWS to define cloud infrastructure. Also in the programming languages that we already know, uh, they offer very good support for JavaScript, actually the best, unfortunately. But then comes Python. So second, but I would say quite good. And again, we have the same set of advantages. We can create a reusable cloud components. We can share them. We can inherit. We can redefine something. Uh, it's a very nice abstraction. There is a huge disadvantage that this only works for AWS. However, because it's develop, developed by AWS and focused on AWS, uh, they abstracted away everything. I didn't find yet a place where I had to write some JSON uh, cloud formation style thingy. It's always Python classes everywhere. So this is really good. Um, this is how it looks like, but we have time for demo. So I would say that instead of going through these examples, we would just jump straight to demo. And I hope you can follow me. I will just sum up the advantages here, and then we go to demo. So it is really, really well designed. It provides very good abstractions. Uh, it's representing cloud resources as uh, in object-oriented way Python classes. This is super good. Uh, IDEs like it, so you can 
command or control click through and you will go to the definition. It will use normal grammar check syntax highlighting. So if you have an error, then it will show you where is the error as opposed to tools like CloudFormation, which is just JSON, which is valid but does not think that it will actually run. And the permissions, you never write it explicitly, like uh, you never write a policy in JSON style. You use, again, Python abstractions. So something like um, user.allow and you pass object that you want to allow access to in the argument. Or bucket.allow read write and you pass a user as an argument, stuff like that. So it's nev you never write a policy. In JSON, you always uh, use it uh, through the abstraction, which is good. And minuses, AWS only, as I say, product from AWS for AWS. And in the background, is does, it does not call the API of AWS. Yes, there is a question. Huh? Ah, uh, no, no, not yet, not yet, no. It's just this, it's good. So it's not calling APIs of AWS directly. Instead, it's actually generating these huge, ugly Shakespeare-style cloud formation templates that you never look into. You just believe it works. But if it doesn't, you actually have to read it. <laughs> Bad part of it. Now, demo time. I promised it, and I know this is a really bad idea to do live demos, especially when you are first time on the conference. So let's just do it. First, I need to mirror displays. And this works really good. OK, uh, starting from the very beginning, I have CDK installed. CDK install is just npm install AWS CDK, so you'll have it if you want it. And then you need, uh, I make it bigger, you don't see anything. Please stop me or correct me if something is confusing. OK, now you can see it, I bet. OK. Let's just, okay, this is good. We need to make a directory. PyCon Thailand. CD PyCon Thailand. Um, it wants an empty directory, so let's give it an empty directory. Okay, it has it. Now we create. Now we bootstrap a new CDK project here. So let's see what files are there. There is a readme. Oh, let's just open it in PyCharm. OK, this is really small, but it's OK. So if you, if you open the project and you follow the readme, it already gives you like code snippets that you just need to call. I will not zoom it in because that's boring. If we just follow the readme, we will go our way instead. So I will open app.py. I will zoom it in if it lets me. OK, it did. Let's see what we have here. Uh, like this is empty. CDK application. What it does, it just defines an app, CDK app, and it calls it PyCon Thailand stack. The stack is totally empty. And it's just initializing it, passes a name, and then it calls app.synth. Synth is synthesized, so from the Python file creates an actual cloud resource, if I call a command line command for this. But what is PyCon Thailand stack? Let's go there. And as I, say, as I said to you, ID integration works really well. So we jump to the class definition right here. And this is the description of our stack. The stack is like a collection of cloud resources in, a, in uh, the CDK terms. So here we have the init function. And as comments suggest, uh, here is where you put the actual resources. Like if you want to create a queue, they put it as an example. You have this queue, sqs.queue, blah, the name of the queue, uh, visibility timeout, and other parameters. So all resources we want to have, we put in here. But the resource that we want to have is a Lambda function, because I guess everybody at some point wrote some serverless functions. So let's have a function here. I will copy the function that I prepared here. OK. So I created a function 
this is my shiny function. I created it right now, one hour before the talk, so I hope it works. Uh, it's uh, something calling weather API, and let's see if it works. So Python weather app.py. It goes to the weather API, and it says feels like plus 36 degree today, partially cloudy. I love this feels like thing. So first I thought it's a good use case because I live in Munich that this thing will tell me when I need to take umbrella with me, but then I thought I'm in Thailand, so it doesn't really make sense. So let's say when, when it's overly hot, it should send me a notification. And for me today, overly hot is this heat limit, which is 35. You can laugh on me, but that's, that's my heat limit. So if current, if the temperature for today is higher than this limit, I want to see this message, the alert. So again, I run it. It is over 35 because it's 36, so I receive the alert. But it's stupid to run it on my machine, so let's deploy to the cloud. And to deploy to the cloud, we need to define a resource of a Lambda function and indicate to this specific function so that we can deploy to the cloud. First, let's check CDK LS. LS is like list uh, in normal shell commands. So it says I have just one stack. That's it. No functions, no nothing. So we need to create it. Um, I also need to install requirements. I need to actually install virtual env. So I do standard things. And I copy and paste on purpose from the tutorial. So you can follow it one to one, and it will work pip install minus r requirements txt. I think it's weather. Yeah. Um, let it complete the installation. Done. Very good. OK, now I will use some copy pasting to copy my lambda function here. I go back to the, st to the stack. The stack is empty. So in the place where they have this queue, I will just paste my Lambda function. Um, OK, that's it. So what did, what did we create? We create a Python function. I forgot to import it, so I will just import it. OK, import it correctly. All good. Also here, AWS Lambda. Good. So uh, this is all you need to create a Lambda function in CDK. You import Python function. You instantiate it as a normal class. And you pass in the name of the function, uh, pass to the function. So for me, it's under weather directory. Then you need to specify the main file and the main function inside of the file, so the entry point to the function. Then you say which runtime, 3.10. I think uh, Lucas was very convincing, so it should be 3.13. But for the sake of the demo, let's keep it as it is. And if you want some environment variables, you can also specify them here. One thing is missing here is, of course, my AWS account. So. To correct that, it's inside of the app.py. It says here I need to specify the environment, and I will just copy-paste my environment. This is my environment. I'm missing the import, so from like this. All right. OK, I think we have it. So environment is just my account ID and the region. And this is Asia, because we are in Thailand. So I changed the default region. Now let's be bold and do CDK deploy. One error in token. OK, not a problem. As I say, the, the fact that it shows me errors just like in any Python program is really good, because I do not need to check new language whatsoever. It's just a syntax error somewhere in my stack definition here. Uh, 
it's a wrong this. OK. This will take a while. So uh, on the first deployment, what it does is um, uh, it is packaging everything. It is creating CloudFormation template. And then AWS will compare my current state to my desired state. And my current state is functions. Let me reload this page. Nothing. It's empty. So I deleted everything, to be fair. So I have zero function in my region. Uh, in my AWS account, so it is comparing zero state to the complete state, so it will take a while until it will create all the resources, including all the permissions, all the policies. So CDK deploy, yeah, it will take some time. Uh, before it's complete, to wisely use two more minutes that I have for this talk, um, let's go over some stuff here. So Lambda function is boring by itself. It's just one function that you need to call manually in the cloud. Usually what you want is you want either an API gateway to expose the function on the internet publicly, or you want some cron job, some trigger, a CloudWatch event that will periodically call it. In my case, I want my weather check to be called every five minutes or so because I really am afraid of, of a hit. Oh, five minutes, Pfft, that's a luxury, I have five minutes. Should, should be done in five minutes, let's hope so. So uh, just the lambda alone is not much. Uh, let me show you how you do the rest. OK. So AWS event, AWS event targets. I'm adding missing imports now. Good. So we defined our Lambda function already. And now below, where I'm creating a CloudWatch rule. This is a cron job to call my function every five minutes. So all it takes is these four lines. I say AWS events rule. I pass the name of the rule, weather alert rule. And then I create a schedule, how often I want it to be called. And I say it's a rate of a duration of minutes. And I pass one minute as an argument, because we do not have much left. So just one minute here. And now I need to connect the rule with the function. So this is the next line, event rule dot add target. Uh, event rule is receiving a target, and the target is a lambda function, and we pass the name of the function. And again, IDE like it, so it's really easy if you forget. If you have like, a, you probably have a huge system, a complicated one, you are having tons of files, and it's difficult to jump around, so just Control click will always throw you to the definition. Like here, oh, this is event rule. What lambda function are we passing here? Oh, that's easy. Click this one. And where is the actual code of it? Oh, it's in the weather directory, app.py. So again, you just open it in your IDE, go to the source. Ah, here is the source. You have your infrastructure code as well as your actual function code in the same directory, in the same language. This is convenient as hell. Let's see how is deployment. Aha. Uh -huh. It says, uh, what are we creating? It warns you one more time before you actually do it. So I hit yes. And now it's creating the cloud formation change set. And then it will create the actual thing. Was that time including Q&A or no? Anybody from the conference? Is this with Q&A or without Q&A? I can finish earlier. Is it uh, is five minutes including question and answers or not including? How much time do I have? That's it. Okay, that's it. Okay, then you'll just have to believe me. Create in progress. So this we we can do Q and A, and I oh, I leave this open so that you see. Also, one more thing I prepared. Oh, okay. Total time here, so it's it should be deployed. Here it is. We are in. This is a function. If I want to test it, test, test, test. OK. Details. Here we have this line. Feels like 37.2. 
So that's all it takes to bring your local, little, tiny, and nice Python function in the cloud with CDK. That's it. Uh, okay, while we do q and I will also just mention that I also have here a snippet uh, how you can send yourself these things in your messenger, like Slack, WhatsApp, Telegram, whatsoever. And for that, you would normally need to manually package the dependency library, like Python Slack library or Python Telegram bot library. And this is, it takes a lot of time if you do it manually. But if you do, if you use CDK, then the CDK will actually see that you're using, you're having some Python dependency in your requirements.txt, which is not standard, and it will package it for you, and it will upload it for you. Uh, you really don't have to do anything. So maybe, maybe I will also do that. But let's start with question and answers, yeah? And yeah, we'll see. We can start Q&A. No questions. Then I can just finish my stuff here, OK? I don't need much. So what I have here is my snippet for Telegram, because it does not help me much to read from the cloud console logs, right? I need to receive it on my phone. So I'll just paste it here, import Telegram, import asyncio. Send Telegram message is really just five lines of code. And it's working in asyncio, so I need asyncio as well. So this is all I need to change to, instead of printing things to the console, to send myself a Telegram message with the weather alert. I think that's it. Let's run it with Python. OK, that works. Message received. And I will deploy it again. Meanwhile, you have a second chance to ask questions, because this will take time again. So it's, it's a really good time slot. And I plan to finish on time. No questions. Oh, one question. Yes, please. Oh, maybe you can just say it's strong. Uh, for me, the benefit of AWS CDK is that it has more convenient uh, library functions, everything, and documentation, as opposed to Pulumi, because Pulumi is a multi-cloud thing, and AWS is focused on own products, so it created CDK to be working nicely with its own cloud. So for me, things are more explicit in AWS CDK. They are also more like when they add a new feature to the AWS, it will land immediately in AWS CDK. Obviously, it's their product. In Pulumi, you'll have to wait for the next release, I guess. But both tools are great. And if you have a multi-cloud setup, if you want some specific products of uh, GCP, let's say they have really good, uh, uh, they, I, I, think, I don't like DynamoDB. I actually hate it. So I use Google databases. So if you, you have something from Google, something from Amazon, you have no choice. It will be Pulumi. Otherwise, you'll have to write two different cloud provisioning templates. So I would say if it's just AWS, CDK is more convenient. Multi-cloud, Pulumi, no competition. OK, no more questions or any more questions? OK, one more here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Great question. So uh, Pulumi can keep the state. CDK cannot keep the state at all. It does not even know your state. CDK behind the scenes is just creating cloud formation templates. And then it's cloud formation that's keeping the state, actually comparing the old state versus new state. This is advantage and this is disadvantage as well. If you're good with Amazon toolset and with cloud formation, then you can always jump to the source and see in the cloud formation template what exactly is being done there. But it is not keeping state at all. It's totally outsourcing it to AWS. Yes, it is a huge YAML file that you'll need to read and this is this is 
wonderful. So you have many stacks. When you create each stack, you can specify the region, the environment, everything. And this is just a Python function at the end, well, Python class. So the arguments you pass is what it will be. You can even have a loop like for region in list of regions, and then one same stack you can deploy n times. So all the Python functionality is available to you to hack, or let's say you have many customers, you want to deploy same function for many customers. Again, just a list of customers, and then for customer in customers, execute this stack creation. Okay, uh, so create in progress, update in progress. Uh, you can believe me, this will be working because it did not fail yet, so I assume it will finish. I also already received a notification in my Telegram. Feels like 37.2, which seems like a dream for me because I go to Munich tomorrow. Yeah, so I cannot really complain about Thai weather at this point. Let me just jump really quick back to the presentation. Uh, just for one purpose, to say big thank you for attending and listening to this talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>